What is classic car ownership about? Is it about breaking down in the rain in a lay-by on the motorway and having to fettle your carburettors in order to uh, get your engine running in, in sweet and not stink of fuel? Now, for some people, it is, and fair play to them. Carry on keeping those cars on the road and working on them and maintaining them. But for me personally, in a classic car, I want a car that you can rely on, but also still has that quirky, classic nature. I think that that's what this Mercedes-Benz 190E does. In fact, I think it might well be the ultimate classic daily driver. It's got all of the cool things that you want in a retro or classic car, and very few of the things that you don't. This car is gloriously 1980s. It absolutely oozes that decade, and it's a decade that I personally love. Now, I was born in the 80s, and this is what was around on the roads when I was a little kid. So it came out in 1983, and Mercedes had been working on it for six years. And the reason is, is that this is the, basically the very first C-Class of that segment, the uh, mid-sized or compact saloon car. Mercedes had never built anything like it before, and they wanted to do a good job with it. So they spent £600 million of money then, which is a, a lot of money now, in, in designing it and making sure that they built a car that people would respect. So although this is very much a, a German car, it was designed by an Italian who at the time was the head of design for Mercedes-Benz and he was called Bruno Sacco. And I think he did a very good job with this car because it's very distinctive. It's like no other car that's ever been built before in terms of how it looks. When you see a 190E, you know immediately it's a 190E. It's very neatly designed, it's very square in 80s. It's got nice sort of proportions to it. I've always thought that the shape of the rear with the big wide boot lid looks a bit odd. Like you've got the lights quite far down low and it's kind of like a, the opposite shape to what you'd expect most saloon cars to look like. But Somehow it gives it, well, first of all, it gives it a unique look, but also it kind of gives it this look of solidity, like it's got this really chunky, solid rear end, which is uh, no bad thing. Now, this car is in Ascot grey, which is kind of like battleship grey, and it's quite a rare colour, actually, and I, I really do like it. It's, it's quite, a, in many ways, a modern colour, isn't it? Because almost every car now is some shade of grey. There were three flavours of Mercedes-Benz 190, as it was actually known. This is the 190E, which is basically standing for fuel injection, Einspritzung in German. To be honest, I thought they were all called the 190E until I realised there actually is a 190 and a 190D as well. The 190D, obviously a diesel. Now, Mercedes were championing diesel at that time, and they were sort of at the forefront of diesel development. And then, of course, the 190, which just had a carburettor, that's going to be your more traditional carburettor fettling uh, enthusiast's car. And also, they were not quite so powerful. The original carburettor car had only 90 horsepower. This 190 that I'm in now has 120, so it's an absolute massive difference. Ergonomically, this car is leagues ahead of anything modern because it just has so few things that you actually need to do. Like, you've got a nice little radio here which has been updated to a sort of period-looking Bluetooth thing. So then, you've just got a very simple set of climate controls. Now, in this case, dual-zone climate control, which this has got to be the oldest car I've ever seen that feature in, allowing you to select temperature for both the uh, driver and passenger. Then it's just a case of like, well, do you want it to point at your face, at the floor, whether you want the fan speed to be... Uh, one, two, or three. Now, this particular car doesn't have air conditioning, but you could equip it with that back when it was new, but it was a very expensive option and hardly anyone ever went for it. And, and would it still be working now if you did opt for it? Mm, probably not. You've got many dials, like I've got my little economy meter there, which swings around depending on how much I'm pressing the throttle, telling me off if I have a floor in it now. I didn't think people cared about fuel economy in the 1980s, but uh, Apparently they did. Now it's also got four times electric windows. It's got a manually adjustable mirror on this side and a electronically adjustable one on that side. So that makes sense because I can't reach over there. Now that mirror on that side is actually smaller than this one and I'm not sure why that is. Well, it's a squat square shape and then you've got the elongated rectangle shape on this side. You've got a single wiper blade that covers the whole windscreen and it does it in this kind of very funny way like where it extends when it gets towards the middle to kind of like properly cover the whole screen it's really quite a clever design and it just looks cool as anything when it's on now around the gear shift you've got this lovely little sec section of wood here which is actually the only wood trim that i can find in the whole of this car it's quite strange that they only put it there around the gear shift but it reminds me of like a 1980s record player or something. The switches on it are, are beautiful. This lovely little hazard switch, very, very pleasing to use. And then next to it, got the controls for the electric 
mirror on the left hand side and then you've got the fader for the uh, stereo that would have been in this car when it was new but that meant you could like balance the uh, sound system between the front and the back and, and then a little kid symbol so I can uh, basically switch it between locking the rear windows so that uh, backseat JJ can't, can't open them. At the top here I've got a warning for the seatbelt now it comes on it flashes it doesn't make any sound but it flashes away for the uh, to remind you to put your seatbelt on the thing is unless it's night time you can't really see that it doesn't catch your eye and it doesn't make any noise so I don't think it really helps in terms of reminding you to put your seatbelt on I've also got a little switch here to the right hand side of the dashboard which basically turns the light on in the back so it, this, this car obviously would make a great taxi because I can just go okay it's time to pay up now and uh, turn the light on this car also has a fully functioning sunroof. Very nice, I just put my, oh yeah, yeah, cool my arm down. I am kind of boiling in here with it being lacking aircon, so I tested out the, uh, the little alarm that comes on when you open the door if you've left the lights on, because I always like to do that in 80s cars, because they all have different ways of doing it. And uh, this one's got this really loud buzzing noise, so there's no way that you'd end up leaving the lights on. So as someone who drives a mid-2000s Mercedes as, as the daily driver, I do find it interesting to see what DNA is in this car that, that followed through into mine. And there's quite a lot of little things that you notice uh, that are the same, like the light switch, for example, to turn the lights on, you turn it round, but then you pull it out to switch the fog lights on. You've got the multifunction stalk, which does everything. Is There's only one stalk on the side of the steering wheel. It's on the right-hand side, and it does things like your wash wipe, your full beams, and your indicators all in one stalk. In this car, you get an actual handbrake that you pull up with your hand, unlike many Mercedes-Benz uh, after that. And just like my CLK, there's the bonnet service mode that gives you a second stage to prop it open for easier access to the engine. It's a quite usefully practical car as well for its time. You've got little shallow areas where you can keep your phone or your keys or whatever on this carpeted material, very posh and nice. And it means that nothing slides around, nothing makes any noise. I've got things sitting on here that uh, normally would be rattling away and it's just all quiet and there's no no rattles in this car anyway but glove box over here is a, a pretty reasonable size now of course this car does not have cup holders because cup holders were not really a thing in the 1980s however there is some little indent in the glove box where you can put a cup when you're stopped and you can have a nice little picnic on there you've got door pockets and then of course the boot is a pretty decent size but it suffers from that problem that many cars of its time did which is an enormous load lift which you have to basically lift whatever it is in and then place it into the boot rather than just sliding it in. I remember when I was a kid and I was in bed and I had to go to school I just wished that I could just take my bed to school like I could just drive it to school that's kind of what this car in the best possible way feels like it feels like I'm driving my bed it's it's really comfortable it's really smooth it's really relaxing the travel on the accelerator pedal is enormous and you have to really really push it down far to get the acceleration but it means that whenever you drive away it's dead smooth and the steering wheel on it is absolutely enormous it's just like this massive big disc in front of you like you're the captain captain of a, of a ship and you're kind of floating along on this uh, very smooth surface doing 55 60 miles an hour now and the noise intrusion is pretty good for a car of this era like yeah there's some wind noise I can definitely hear some wind noise on that kind of quite square shape although it actually was quite aerodynamic for its time there's not that much road noise it's not much engine noise it's a pretty well refined car for its time and what you would have expected from a Mercedes-Benz, no less. And of course, because it's a 1980s car, it's just so very easy to place. You've got a literal target on the front of the car, which is the Mercedes-Benz uh, badge sticking up out of the front of the car. And I, that's just so cool. It's like leading the way in front of you. And then you've got the tiny little A-pillars, you've got the square edges of the bonnet. You know exactly where all of the car is around you. The blind spots are, are basically non-existent. Now, ordinarily, I would say that you need all that extra visibility because you don't want to be in a crash in an old car and probably that's still the case with this car you know it's got very thin doors very thin pillars but for its time it was designed as a very safe car and, and bearing in mind by the time this car finished production Euro NCAP didn't exist for another three years and they're the people that actually really pushed for car safety Mercedes-Benz were already there they were already pushing for car safety and they built this car out of incredibly strong steel 
in some versions of the car you could get ABS, you could get airbags. I mean, this car, this car's got ABS for its time in 1990. That was that was pretty high tech. So I've actually done a swap today with my car. So Simon from Lot 76 is driving my car around, and it's quite a, a strange experience to let someone else drive my car, despite the fact that I drive other people's cars for a living, pretty much. It, it's made me appreciate, you know, what you guys um, might go through when you lend me your car, and I really do appreciate um, anybody who does get in touch. But yeah, if you want to see uh, his review of my car, then uh, please do check out his channel, and I'll leave a link in the description. So this car, it did have quite sophisticated five-link rear suspension, as well as a rear-wheel drive setup, but it very much does feel like a comfortable cruiser rather than a, hand, a good handler. Now I'm coming into a little twisty section here, and okay, I mean, it's got front and rear anti-roll bars, and you know, the, the roll, when you're sort of shoving it through an A-road, it's not too bad, but uh, you know, it's not by any modern standards a, uh, a fantastically great car to drive or anything. So what does Backseat JJ think of the Mercedes 190E? What do you think, pal? Oh, mate, I absolutely love this. I love the 80s. The 80s was the best. The music, the style, the fashion, the cars, absolutely everything about it. Fantastic. So I, I think this car is great. I like sitting back here. Okay, the legroom is limited. I am kind of wedged in a little bit here. I've got just, just enough headroom as well. See, it's very plush and comfortable. It's very gray. I've got electric windows, I've got an armrest which folds down, it's very comfortable, very spongy and soft. And then behind me here, the first aid kit, hiding in the real, rear parcel shelf. It's got all sorts of stuff in here, you've got these big, um, well that's for, that's for like removing a man's spleen. And this is the original kit, so it's probably expired somewhat quite a long time ago. Oh, well there you go, it was made in West Germany, so that... That kind of tells you all you need to know about that. Oh, and I've got I've got a little uh, ashtray thing down here because everyone smoked in the 80s. I've also got the world's biggest Jesus handle up here, which has got a little hook which you can move along on the side and hang your uh, business shirt on. And anyway, yeah, it's a nice car, mate. Back to you. Well, I'm glad you approve. Cheers, mate. So what else makes this a great daily driver? Well, first of all, the fuel economy. You're going to get like 35, 36 mpg on, a, on a, a good run. It's a pretty economical car. But not only that, it's got enough power to keep up with modern traffic. 120 horsepower in a, uh, on an 1100 kilo car is really not that bad. And you're talking 0 to 60 in 10.5 seconds, which many brand new cars also do. So you do not have to drive this car slowly and hold everyone up in your classic automobile, which if you were using this every day, is something that you'd want to consider because you wouldn't want to be causing tailbacks just because you want to take your old car out for a drive. So perhaps you're watching this and thinking, oh, I'd quite like a 190E. I mean, but there can't be that many of them left. If I look on Auto Trade, how many are you expecting to see? Well, you'd be surprised because I had a look and there was 31 190s of various versions available. And that is a load of cars for this era. If you look for example for mid-1990s Peugeot 406, which was a much more modern car, came out you know, 20 years after that car, there's one saloon available for sale. And there was loads of those cars back in the day. And what it tells you is, first of all, you know, this car's well built and it was built to last. But it also tells you that there's a lot of enthusiasm for them. There's a lot of people out there that are willing to keep these cars on the road for a long time. And it's that combination of things that is what keeps cars around. It's the well built, but also cared for. If you can think of a more usable daily classic than this, please do let me know in the comments because I think this is the ultimate classic daily driver. It's solid, well-built car. They're relatively rust-free for cars of that time. Um, obviously it's old now, so rust will happen. They're reliable, they're well-built. They've got fuel injection, which uh, is much easier to deal with than carbur carburetors. And there's parts availability and there's a community of them. There's plenty of them still around. They're not that expensive to buy. They're economical. You can get 35 MPG out of them there's just a heck of a lot going for them. And not only that, but you get to drive around in an absolute classic piece of the 80s. Thank you very much to Simon for lending me the car from Lot 76, um, so you can see his channel there. And um, if you want to see another video on another car, please check out that video there, and uh, I'll see you in the next video.